Welcome to Elixir Wizards, a podcast brought to you by Smart Logic, a custom web and mobile development shop based in Baltimore. My name is Justice Epen, and I am your host. I'm joined by my co-host, Eric Ostrich. And this season, we're talking about system and application architecture. We're joined by a special guest, Mr. Eric Steen. How are you, Eric? Hi. So we have two Eric's on the show today. That's exciting. Yeah. It might have happened before. I think it's happened once. But this time is going to be the best time. We try to make every episode the best episode we've ever done. Eric, before we started recording, we were talking a little bit about programmer burnout and how it happens and how to cure it. What's your take on this? Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's been something that's been on my mind. I've been watching a couple of YouTubers that kind of deal with this subject and I've been trying to wrap my head around it. Doing 10 years of Ruby on Rails kind of becomes a little mundane for, for me, particularly. I, I've just, so I've been, <laughs> I've been trying to figure out like, okay, learn a new technology, potentially move on to shift onto another role within an organization uh, that's not quite, you know, building, doing emails and all these kind of mundane tasks that you end up doing a lot of times, it kind of leads you down a frustration hole of like, can I do anything creative? Or is it always going to be these mundane, tedious, routine things that, that, that I have to do over and over and over? So I've been kind of throwing that around and how to deal with that. And in my view, you know, from, from what I've studied over the last month or so, it seems like you have a couple of options. You either go into management as an engineer to, to change, you know, change it up, or you go like I said to another, you know, maybe you get into the, as a designer or as something something else that you're interested in or a product manager. So when you say programmer burnout, you mean like some people say burnout and they mean I've been working a lot of hours for like a long time and I just need like a vacation. You're saying burnout from the profession. Yeah, I think kind of kind of uh, a lot of people get burned out on tech and they you know I've met people who say I did the tech thing for a while and it just it was I got I was underwhelmed with how things are run and things like that. And, and I had to get out and change careers. And some guys who have been in a long time, 30, 40 years now are struggling with lead code, the whole lead code thing and how you have to do these kind of old 70s algorithms to get a job where you're not ever going to use a lot of these algorithms. I mean, and now with machine learning kind of conquering our jobs and the code generation and program synthesis that's going on at the highest level of our universities and at our organizations, how are we going to compete with these machines and things like that? So it becomes it becomes a real problem and something I think we need to figure out how to deal with. Yeah, I've been preaching the commoditization of Ruby on Rails style development is is imminent. Yeah, yeah, like Webflow and things like this. Like, hey, you, marketing department can throw up a membership based website in you know a day or two based on these new technologies. So like Ruby on Rails is kind of going the way of the of the dinosaur, it seems. Yeah, but you've been working in Elixir. We're really excited to talk about one of your projects that you've got on GitHub. It's called Automata. We're not going to get there yet because Eric's got some questions before we get to it, but I'm really excited to talk about it because that's sort of what introduced you to us, and it's a really cool project. Yeah, great. Tell us a bit about yourself, uh, like where do you work, et cetera. Sure. So I just uh, left Hippo Insurance, and I'm looking for a role, actually. So if anybody's hiring for an Elixir developer, I'm, I'm available. But I've been doing Ruby on Rails mostly for the last 10 years and have been working really hard. This is kind of related to programmer burnout, working really hard in my free time and on the weekends to upskill myself and, and get a lot of AI expertise and a lot of Django and Python and Swift for TensorFlow and these kind of newer uh, new technologies that are really coming on the scene to d build the next level of scalable intelligent systems as envisioned by Carl Hewitt at Stanford University. And with the Apple glasses coming out and things, we've got to start to try to rethink how we build these things. And Ruby on Rails to me is not the way to do it. And I've been trying to shift off that and it's it's pretty difficult. Can you talk about that Carl Hewitt comment? I, I don't, I'm not familiar with his work. So Carl Hewitt, he invented the actor system at MIT. I think it was the Media Lab, the early early days with Minsky when he, he started the whole AI lab at MIT, which was the first of its kind. And he invented the actor model, which is a way of doing, it's kind of like, it's a framework for building systems, kind of like object-oriented programming is or functional programming is. It's just a different way to think about it. And in my view, it's a really, really powerful way to think about it. And I think Elixir is really well situated to handle these, you know, these multiple cores, obviously. So as they come on the scene, this thing is prepared, well prepared for that. And the act, apparently the actor model is really, one of the primary methods by which those at the high level of the universities are now thinking about possibly 
you know, having optimal scalable intelligent systems, which the whole world is trying to build. China, every major country is trying to build these large scalable intelligent systems that have AI kind of baked into them. And so we're in a, we're in a good spot here with Elixir. And we got, we got the Matrix library, we got TensorFlex, we got a lot of new interesting pieces and parts and building blocks coming on the scene. So it's a good time. So I'm a little bit of an AI I guess enthusiast, um, hobbyist might be another word. You've got in our show notes here a note about uh, Gene Shear's book. Can you talk about that? Because it's one of the coolest books and nobody talks about it. Yeah, you actually, we talked about it when we first talked and I hadn't really looked into it. I'd seen it before, but I had never really gotten interested until I talked to you and then I took a look deeper. I actually bought the book and went heads on. It's like a $150 book. Yeah, it's like 100 is really expensive, but it was worth it because that guy, I mean, he walks you through from beginning to end how to build your own neural evolutionary system for basically evolving neural networks. And this is really interesting work because we're constrained in Elixir. We can't do backpropagation. We can't do really high uh, dimensional functional pro- approximation. So being able to evolve a feed forward neural network without any backpropagation is really, really, really exciting and something that I want to get, get into heavily. So why can't we do backpropagation? And what is backpropagation? Oh, right. Yeah. What is backpropagation? <laughs> backpropagation is a way to basically approximate the weights in a neural network and biases in a neural network by after you fed forward through the network, you at the end of it, you basically feed back through the network and set what the weights would have been had you known what the outcome was at the end, right? If that, that's kind of a long-winded way to explain it, but essentially that's what it is. And so what that does really is that kind of constrains you because you have to do really high dimensional number crunching with some kind of high dimensional linear solver, does the linear algebra at the really low level. And Elixir has really been missing that, you know, we don't, we don't have that kind of thing. It's not the great with float. It's if I guess a float is a float is a float. You know, it'll compute a gradient or whatnot, but it won't. Well, it won't compute a gradient, but it'll compute two floats just like Ruby or just like Python or just like anything else. But we don't have kind of the NumPy, right? We need the NumPy. So Matrix looks interesting. I haven't dug deep into it, but there are a couple projects, TensorFlex and Matrix, that gives us that. But but we don't need it. I mean, essentially, we can evolve these things, feed forward neural networks without backpropagation using something like what Gene Schur is proposing in his book. It's called The Handbook of Neuroevolution Through Erlang. Right. Yeah, we'll we'll link to that. It's a great, it's a great book. And somebody actually implemented what he builds in the book in Elixir. I believe there's a there's probably 10 libraries out there that have done something with it. Oh really? Yeah. Some of them are better than others, but yeah, I've done looked in search in GitHub and there are there are a number of people who are trying to bring it. A lot of them are older and abandoned. So I'm putting it into uh, Automata as a potential automaton. And it's a multi-agent heterogeneous system. So I'm trying to build something that allows us to, just like the real world, have what you would call kind of quote unquote neurodiversity or different agents. Because if you look out there, a lot of the multi-agent work is using homogeneous agents, which are basically all the same type of agent. You know, whether it's a, a, a decentralized partially observable Markov decision process or something similar. And they're all kind of the same little organism. And uh, we're going to ask a lot of naive questions here. You just described a partially observable Markov process. Can you maybe parse that out a little bit for us? A Markov decision process is a way to, if you have a state space, so say a grid world, you have a Pac-Man grid world, then uh, a Markov decision process, what it does is it kind of lets you predict what the your reward and the value of a particular state next state would be based on only the current state's information right you don't have to look back in the past and look at your history and go figure out like what past actions made any sense for what i want to do next you're basically just looking at where you are and what the value would be in the next state and so that means what it does is it looks stochastically through the environment and figures out which spot in the distribution of possible actions is makes the most sense in terms of long-term reward if that makes any sense i think so and we're going to ask a lot of questions like this as we as we go along i think now is a great time to kind of just talk about automata but before we do let's try to get through the general questions i think that uh we're gonna have a lot to go into on automata what does architecture mean to you architecture means to me it kind of means it implies more of a higher level than design because design and architecture are two kind of overlapping concepts that we talk about all the time. 
And I think to me, architecture would mean you can architect an app, I think, but and that would be like a high level of the app. Like, how do I do it? Do I do it with microservices? Do I do it with service mesh? Do I do it with just a monolith or microservices within monolith, perhaps? Or if we're talking about design, we're talking about maybe the functions and the modules and the design patterns and how these particular couple of components fit together, things like that. Design would be lower level to me. Architecture would be more at the machine, kind of Amazon, you know, web services. We've got a couple of microservices out here and a big data pipeline and a Lambda architecture over here and this and that. So that's kind of how I think about it. So is that distinct from infrastructure? So when I think infrastructure, I think, you know, yeah, we set up, we have a bunch of machines and we, you know, we're procuring machines and we're thinking about it from the network level of just machines and abstractly, we don't care about what's inside them. For infrastructure to me and Terraform and, the, and Kubernetes and these kind of things, Istio, and these kind of new technologies for managing the network from a very, very high level where you don't even care what's on it. But where architecture, we talk about the architecture of a project, you're talking about, you know, the actual business domain comes into play more. So, yeah. One of the things we've been liking to ask across everyone in addition to architecture, like what that means to you is, do you have any opinions on domain-driven design? Yeah, I really loved it. Ever since I discovered it, I, I thought it was kind of the holy grail. And I don't think anybody does it per the book, but I think the concepts have been really valuable that people have taken. Like you use the language of the ubiquitous language, for example, and the bounded context, which are two of the probably most prominent concepts that came out and really took hold in the in the in the industry. And so I think speaking of we were speaking of architecture, I think, and so the bounded context really comes into play there, right? Now, let's talk about Automata. What is it and how would I use it? Why would I use it? Okay. So it started out, I was reading a great book called The Elixir and OTP Guidebook. And he makes a worker pool in that book. And he walks you through how to make a standard kind of worker pool. And so I was all the way through the book and I was looking at the kind of the whole app he built and something if I, I guess I squinted and said, wait, can I turn this into a, uh, a multi-agent system? Can I repurpose this thing? So I started working on it. I just started toying around with it and it took a few weeks and I kind of molded it into what I thought would be an excellent multi-agent heterogeneous system. It started as a behavior tree only. And I said, okay, I'll just build a behavior tree. So I don't know if you want to go down that rabbit hole yet, but Sure, sure, sure. Tell us, uh, you know, just a quick explanation of what a behavior tree is. Okay, sure. So a behavior tree is a way to build an autonomous agent when you know kind of what the behavior is. So versus reinforcement learning or something where you don't really know whether you want the agent to explore on its own and figure out what the optimal behavior is. With a behavior tree, you, you know what you want the thing to do, how you want it to behave. And so you encode that into the, into the behavior tree and let it run. Like a set of nested conditionals? Yes, yes. It's very much like that. It's just basically like a finite state machine, but more broad and more kind of... Because they were using that in gaming, finite state machines forever for their AIs. And they they, they, they transitioned to behavior trees, I guess, 10 years ago. And they're using utility, utility AI a lot now. Things like that. They're moving beyond. So Automata starts out as what? A framework for building behavior trees with Elixir? Yeah, that's what it was. It was going to be a framework for building behavior trees. But then I was like, why not do the loon shot Elon Musk thing? Let's go. <laughs> so I just went crazy and I, I just started abstracting everything out, bringing it out. And it, so now it's a research experiment to see if we can build a heterogeneous multi-agent system with a number of different types of agents that interact and, and are controlled at a meta level to carry out you know specific goals that, that you want to carry out. And I think we our teams are neurodiverse. We have people that are very neurodiverse working on our teams. And so if we're going to build AIs that are going to like help us entertain us and, and, and manage our pain and things like this, we're going to need neurodiversity because, you know, what's, what's pleasing to you and what's pleasing to me are probably two different things in, in an agent, right? And in an intelligent thing that's going to be my, my robot and, and help me achieve things, which I think is where we're headed. I and mean, it seems very much in my studies of AI that we are definitely headed pretty rapidly in that direction. And so we're going to need neurodiversity. And I think, Neuroevolution is and novelty search, which we can also get into, are going to be key ways to achieve that. So, what is like an agent in the context of the system? You're saying they can be neurodiverse, meaning they can behave differently or have different sort of behavior models, I guess. What does an agent c kind of consist of in Automata? 
So an agent would be a state space representation, kind of a data model, could be a graph, could be something simpler or something more advanced, could be a neural network alone, could be a neural network in combination with other tools and building blocks. Um, but it's essentially a, an automaton or a, an agent, it's, I'm using those two to mean the same thing, would be one agent could solve possibly one task or think of a soccer, like a soccer game. And we have the, the goalie. Well, that's one agent, right? And we have, we have a multi, those are the common multi-agent systems. And we also have to take into account from a higher level, what, what each interval thing is, is doing in, in relation to the whole and the goal for the whole, the whole team. And so that's where the automata piece comes in. We have a boundary at that level to kind of, an anti-corruption linker for any signal that comes in to optimize the goal of the entire team, whereas each one of those things might have individual objectives and goals to do. But it, but in these things, they most people find that it's more important to think about it from the higher level because why would you be doing a multi-agent system if you weren't concerned with the higher level objective, right? But then when we talk about novelty search and the work coming from Uber AI Labs and Kenneth Stanley from University of Florida, we're talking about an entirely different way. We don't even talk about objectives. We talk about novelty and new interesting behaviors. And they've found that this stuff outperforms just being tied to one objective goal and, and trying to achieve it. Instead, trying to achieve maximum diversity in behaviors. And that way, these things, learn. they learn quicker that way oftentimes. Like teaching a bipedal to walk learns quicker if you say, do whatever you want to do. Try anything crazy as long as it's not like the thing you just did last time. This is out of Uber's research lab? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's Kenneth Stanley who works at Uber Research Lab, and I don't think it's a heavy part of what they do at Uber. It may be part of it, but he did most of it at, at UCF in, uh, in Florida before he worked at Uber, I think, a lot of the research. And it's really interesting work. He actually wrote a book about it. Oh, I forgot the name of the book, but we can look it up. It's Kenneth Stanley. We will look it up, and we will include it in the show notes. Great. Uh, let's talk a little bit. I mean, continue to dive into the architecture here, like Automata. We were reading the uh, documentation. You've got this idea of environment versus reasoning versus knowledge. Can you talk about what these are and how they play into Automata? And, and I'm also just curious, like, how do I use it, right? Like, do I pull it into a project? Do I use it as sort of like a framework to, to, to build these agents? Yeah, maybe just talk about sort of in pra practical terms what the process is. So the idea would be to kind of build these interchangeable environment models, so data models, for to match up with different types of agents. So there would be a kind of a library of different ways of managing that meta level control of the entire automata, or there would be that also that that individual control of each automaton. That would be an interchangeable reasoning component at that level. So we would have reasoning components for different types of agents available to mix and match, and they would match based on the environment. So if we have, for example, a stock market environment or in an economic environment and a fundamentals environment and a, and a volatility environment or whatever kind of, you know, me, I'm into finance. I really like to, to analyze fun, financial stuff and do stock trading. So, so we could have different environments for that. So an environment is like, the stock market's data streaming into your system. Yeah, so okay. I went with the lingo of the industry. So we call them worlds, right? In, in our in reinforcement learning, we have a world and we have that world, you know, can pull data from a, from a feed and provide it to the system. We'll have ways of, you know, blackboards, knowledge bases and blackboards. That's, that's how it works in AI. You don't think about a database as, you know, a relational model. You think about it as, here's the knowledge I need for intelligent behavior. How can I best capture that and provide it, you know, in a, in a, in a good, efficient way? things like that. And that's what's fun, right? Outside of work, like we can do database relational model all day, but outside of work, we want things that, that do what we what we need done. So it's not usually like a CRM. Yeah, I've, I've messed around with behavior tree stuff a little bit in one of my side projects, but it sounds to me what I wrote in a single weekend is way less complex than, <laughs> than what Automata is doing. But I have a very important question for you. When you type behavior now, after working in Elixir, do you always add the U? No, I actually have a behavior module for Automata because a behavior tree has a behavior component. But absolutely, I had that, I had that struggle in the beginning. I did mistype that a number of times. But yeah, behavior with a U, behavior. It says right in Automata somewhere. And that's how you pull in the behavior of a, of a tree node. Yeah. 
So how do you define these behavior trees? Right now, the way that I've done it, it's just like effectively a big JSON file that kind of gets read into data uh, and it's ridiculously verbose. So do you have a, a better way? Is, is your, are your trees also super verbose? Hopefully not. I, I really hope not, but they could become that way because I want to provide as much customization as possible. So I'm allowing people to define like a module that uses Automata. And I've recently read that the Elixir community is kind of moving away from the use macro. And unfortunately, I have to dig deeper into that. <laughs> but I'm using the use macro everywhere. So <laughs> I, have to, I have to dig a look at that. You would use Automata, provide a bunch of configuration, and provide an update function, which would run asynchronously to give you a reactive behavior tree that will react in real time to any signal that it receives and proactively explore an environment essentially. That's the unique thing about behavior trees is they provide a state space representation and an action selection mechanism in one complete unit, so to speak. Have you seen anyone use this in the wild yet? Have I Have I used it? Yeah. Have you used it to build anything or has, has anyone else used it that you're aware of? No, no. It's still, in, it's still in very early stages. It's really a research experiment. It's not ready for production. It probably will be within a year or two, but I definitely want to take Talking about the the whole uh, novelty search thing, I definitely want to take an open ended creative approach to this in a long term view. That would be a Jeff, a Jeff Bezos inspiration of the long term, you know, and really take a long term view and try to build something really of high quality. I'm really trying not to rush things, so we'll see how that works out. But it's kind of going against the grain of what we're used to doing in our day to day. But I think it'll pay out in the long run. We'll see. I'd really like to see if I could use this for chatbots and somehow maybe pull some of your modules into Virtuoso. And especially once you get the novelty thing working out, because that's the hardest part of natural language is like generating something novel and interesting for the bot to say. Super, super challenging. I mean, it's, it's challenging even if you have like a huge corpus of data, just because even a massive corpus of conversational data doesn't really encompass a lot of like the conversation we're having right now is the only time this conversation has, has ever happened, right? Like no one else has had this conversation. So to try to generate what the next thing would, would be in the conversation is just ridiculous. So you've got several reinforcement learning neural network concepts that you're either that are already built in or going to be built in. Um, can you talk us through maybe like progress where you are and uh, what's coming up next? Sure. So I went really divergent. So I don't know if you've read the uh, Google Ventures Sprint book or anything like that. But I have. Yeah, yeah, where you go divergent, brainstorm, and then you go convergent and kind of narrow down a path to achieve the objective, come up with a coherent plan. So I've been really divergent for the past few months since I started it. And now I'm starting to converge and narrow down because I wanted to do like informed search and a bunch of the kind of the lower level things you learn in college when you're learning AI. But I don't think those are going to be useful to people. So I'm just going higher level and going with the things that I think the community is going to want, you know, once this thing really gets mature and I'm pretty committed to it. I've been known to start a few projects and just leave them, but I'm pretty committed to this one. So I could really use help in kind of like, we have this idea of the operator and it's kind of just spins up the world and handles failures from these different agents and things. And so that's a piece that, I really need help with somebody who's really good with kind of the more logistical side of programming, I suppose, where I'm the more abstract kind of programmer, I guess. And I really want to work on the neural networks and the, the uh, neural evolution piece going, going forward mostly, as well as the deck pump DP, which is the decentralized Markov, partially observable Markov decision process. So I've got like a sort of a loose idea of what a Markov process is, but like all the parts boards before that, part, like partially observable. Can you give us like any kind of insight into like what some of that is? I feel like everything in machine learning is like, here's like a basic concept, like a neural network. And then here's like a bunch of words that modify that concept in complicated ways. Yeah. So that's what that, that, that does that for the Markov decision process. We talked about the stochastic, like knowing what to do from one state only. And it's basically what it's all saying is that it's decentralized so that, you know, each agent can act on its own without bring, you know, and if it fails, it doesn't bring down the whole system and things like that. And it also means that, which Elixir is perfect for, by the way, such a great language. And 
the other part of that is the uh, partially observable, which just means you have a world. Say you're in, you know, you're in, you guys are in your office. Well, there's a whole world outside your office, but you're just programming for your particular office. So that would be partial observability of the world. You're not taking into account the cars driving by outside and things like you're only programming for that particular partial observ observable environment. Okay. Okay. And then talk about, because you've got a number of sort of other concepts, reinforcement learning concepts, net neural network concepts. It sounds like you're maybe so bandits, TD learning, deep learning, the deck palm dp then the t-w-e-a-m-n we've got all these kind of concepts listed out here it sounds like you're kind of leapfrogging the first few because you wanted to focus on the markov decision process and also this this evolving neural network concept can, can you talk us through like it sounds like you're working right now on the evolving neural network yeah getting that kind of up and running and yeah go, go into it a little bit like it's partially inspired by uh, the work of kenneth stanley probably from this book that we were talking about earlier that's the direction I definitely want to go, the novelty search direction. Uh, it just makes a ton of sense. And I actually think the reason they wrote a book is because they saw it was incredibly useful for better performance of their of their genetic programming, their uh, whatever they're doing with genetic programming, which is where that falls into, by the way. And we can talk about that if you want. But Where what falls into? The novelty search actually falls into the genetic okay. programming component of the neuro evolution so because it's evolutionary right because it's evolutionary because neuroevolution is an evolution part it's a subset of evolutionary computation so genetic programming is used to evolve these things basically you know generate a population of neural networks and then you create you know offspring and you mutate the genes the genotype has this been used like in the real world to accomplish anything useful because it's just such like a one-to-one -one abstraction of a biological concept that i'm trying to figure out like how valuable it would actually be. Yes. I think one of the best examples is there's, I'm pretty sure they're using neuroevolution for this if they're not something similar, but they're actually building a bridge in Europe that's just no humans involved. Ah, uh, yeah, I've seen this. Uh, Adobe, right? Yeah, Adobe. And they're doing, and the Autodesk is really heavily into this type of thing where they're building new novel things out of just the computer just generates these new novel ideas about how to do optimize like tires for cars and things, right? You know, I've seen they, they made an antenna for like NASA where they try to find like the optimal shape using an evolution. And it came out with a really weird shape. Like you never would have figured it out on your own. Right. So, yeah, they definitely do use it for some for, for some practical things. But it's not like we're not using it for web development yet. <laughs> right. Not yet. Well, with Octonoma, it's a possibility. We'll see if we can get there. I think we can. What is like an application you'd like to see someone use Automata for like early on? Oh, you know, I have all kinds of ideas about this, but I'm I'm really into crypto trading. I mean, I think the crypto thing opens up a whole new market for people to really play around with and see how they can, you know, you're never going to make a, be a bazillionaire doing this, but it's a lot, you know, you can definitely manage your risk and and make a little little income. Perhaps, I mean, there's a lot of people trading with their brain full time for a living. And so, if you can automate that like everything else we're trying to do, then great, right? So that would be something I'd really be interested in getting involved with. If anybody out there wants to do that, I want to ask a question because we it kind of came up earlier with the programmer burnout conversation and you're working on this like really fascinating project and you're like living right in the middle of Silicon Valley. Does it feel like to you things have sort of stagnated in terms of like really interesting stuff to do? Like <laughs> there's always like a new like social media thing or someone's trying to build like, you know, real time chat with people from all over the world or whatever. You know, when we when we're talking about this actual interesting problem of like artificial intelligence and centralized systems, the only things that it seems to be being really used for is like you know ad recommendations on Netflix or book recommendations on Amazon. It's always a recommendation engine, <laughs> right? Right. It seems like it's a lot of yeah, a lot of mundane stuff it's used for. But you know, I do think that's changing, and I think if you look at Swift for TensorFlow, for example, the kind of things they're doing that directly into mobile apps that record observations of the things you're, it's like the old thing of adaptive websites that adapt to you. You know, you go on a, you go on a membership site or something and the whole interface just adapts to you. Everything adapts to you. That that's becoming more of a reality with some of these new tools. So that's one direction, but for, for what we do day to day. Right. And I think people are going to build a lot of interesting things with that. Is Elixir picking up steam in the Valley? It seems like it to me. Yeah. I mean, triple bytes, the big, kind of recruiter thing and they've been mentioning elixir a lot in their blog and added it to kind of their their marketing materials it feels like it's accelerating to you yeah it seems like it that's good to know because then our downloads will keep going up
<laughs> and hopefully we'll get more business too. By the way, thanks you guys for what you do. I really appreciate what you do. You know, a lot of a lot of programmers are introverts and so on, like me included. And we do, like networking may not be at the top of our priority list. And what you guys provide for the community is hugely valuable. So thanks a lot. Well, we're really glad to have you on, and we really appreciate you coming on and talking about. A lot. I mean, it's really hard to come on to a show and to talk about very complicated ideas, right? And yeah, so we really appreciate when people take the leap and 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 do that. I want to give you time to plug anything you want, shameless self-promotion, ask the audience anything you like. The floor is yours. Okay, sure. So yeah, I'm looking for a job in Elixir or Python. Been doing Ruby on Rails for a lot of years and looking to move on beyond that to something with a better garbage collector and a little bit more scalable and a little bit more concurrent and a little bit more fun to work in. And I'm running my side hustle, which is www.cryptowise.ai. And Please sign up. Give, give us the elevator pitch on that. What, what is CryptoWise? CryptoWise is a platform framework for analyzing and researching crypto, not only technicals of you know, quant type technicals, but also fundamentals and trying to build out a community that really enjoys financial analysis and wants to get involved with other people and do that kind of on a collaborative basis. And I think one of the long-term visions for Autotoma would be for example, to incorporate Horde and things like right that things like Horde and LibCluster and these things that are going to progress to a point to where we really do have a really unique distributed platform to build on, and I think that's a few years away probably for Elixir, but that's the goal, right? They're going from Flow to they want to help programmers get distributed, and that's what Jose talks about. So I think I think if we can collaborate together, and so we could have different types of analysts analyzing different segments of the market and somehow incorporate all that into a meta level framework for analyzing the companies that we work with in the United States and elsewhere, global companies, and trying to figure out how to kind of do financial work on that. It's kind of hard to describe, but the vision is definitely collaborative and it's a very engineering focus. So right, you have a ton of financial websites and platforms that are kind of like more like social networks and these kind of things. This one, I want it to be really focused on the quantitative aspects and the computational aspects of, and the AI aspects of analyzing financial information, economic information. So it's not content. It's like, it's like analysis software. It would be like a collaborative analysis platform ecosystem for bringing together various entities that want to specialize on different aspects of finance. Yes. Very cool. I was so into crypto. I mean, a few years ago, and then I kind of just set all my investing on, you know, it takes a lot of time to follow every shit coin. But I, I was really interested in wondering if this has happened yet. Like, has anyone built an exchange like on a, on a chain of any kind yet? Oh, I'm, I, there's so many exchanges. I swear. I, there's got to be something. There's got to be. Like, I, I was figuring there's got to at some point be basically like a, like a meta coin that basically allows you a decentralized blockchain driven ledger that allows like exchange driven trading on the chain. Oh, there was, I think look up Equitrader. I'm pretty sure. Equitrader. Not, yeah. Okay. Equitrader. Cause I've been out of the loop for a while because you know, it is, dude, it just became, it became out of control. It became completely out of control where it's like so many things. And you know, I'm still basically a Bitcoin purist. I'm like, look, it, Bitcoin is Coke. Ethereum is Pepsi and everything else is just, you know, a thing, right? It's tab. <laughs> right. So I've been buying Coke and Pepsi. Grocery store brand. All right. And then Blocks Route. Check it out. Blocks Route. Okay. We'll definitely try to get these on the show notes. The other one is that I thought was actually interesting was Hollow Coin, I think. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. Anyway, thank you so much for coming on the show. Everybody go check out Automata on GitHub. It's a really cool Elixir project. Check out cryptowise.ai. Before we close out, we've got to share another edition of Pattern Matching with Todd. Friend of the podcast, Todd Resedek, is asking members of the Elixir community five questions to help us all get to know each other better. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you for joining me for another installment of Pattern Matching with Todd, where I ask your favorite Elixir personalities five questions in an attempt to get to know them better. My guest today is probably best known for his library, Jason, which has been downloaded over 18 million times. Taking time away from his duties at WhatsApp, Michal Muskawa. Hi, Todd. 
Thank you for joining me today. I'm looking forward to getting to know you better. Thank you for having me. All right. So let's get started. Where were you born? So if you thought my name is hard to pronounce, I'll give you a curveball now. I was born in a city called Hozhov, which is in the middle of south of Poland. But I moved probably when I was like one and a half or something like that. So I have no recollection of living there. But I moved not far away to, to a neighboring city of Katowice and grew up there. Okay. I've seen it on television, Katowice. It looks like a beautiful, beautiful city. What kind of industry is in, in that area? Like, how did your parents end up there? The traditional industry is coal mining and like smithing and this kind of heavy industry. Okay. Or smelting, right? That's, I think that that's more appropriate. So yeah, heavy industry, but neither of my parents worked uh, in, in those industries. So that they're both economists. Oh, is there a university or some somewhere that they worked in Katowice? Yes, there are actually two universities. There's like a university and then a technical university as well. Okay, too far off the rails here, but is that did you go to school in Katowice? Yeah, I did. All right, so you you were born in Hajuv, you moved to and grew up in Katowice, and where where are you living now? Uh, so in August last year, I moved to London. And I have to say, I was really enjoying the city and everything that it offers until everything closed. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy from with, with the move. Oh, great. We've got a lot, of, a lot of really good programmers in Poland, but also a lot of really good programmers in London. So hopefully you've had time to connect with at least some of them. Yeah, there's quite a few Elixir and Erlang people here in, here in London. So the, the meetups are, are always fun to hang out with people. I heard the meetup is like like 100 people show up every month. Is that true? Yeah, it, it's really crowded. It's, it's really crowded. It's really big. That is amazing. I don't think I've ever heard of an Elixir meetup that's had more than maybe 40 or 50 people. So that's really something. So moving on, have you had any careers before programming? Uh, not really. Uh, so basically my first job I ever got was right after high school and before I went to university and it was doing Ruby on Rails for like a small startup. It was all extremely shady and weird, but I learned a lot, mostly what not to do. Had you done Rails like before that, just in your own time? Uh, yeah, I, I did Rails on my own before that. I, I had a, basically a friend and in high school working as a programmer for quite a while by the time we graduated. Wow. And like he knew I was doing some stuff and needed some help. So I, I joined him. Okay. So was, was Ruby like your first programming language or had you been doing other stuff before that? Probably like touched a bit of PHP before doing Ruby. But like Ruby was like the first language when I would say I was proficient with yeah, the, the interesting interesting bit about the my my friend who who introduced me to working with with Ruby is that he's now doing Elixir as well. Oh, really? Do you want to give him give him or her a shout out? Yeah, well, thank you, Arthur, for helping me to to work as a programmer. And now he's asking you questions about Elixir, I assume. Uh, we talk every now and then. That's good. Okay, so you haven't had any other paying jobs besides programming. But let's say you couldn't be a programmer anymore. What do you think you'd do? Uh, so when I went to university, I actually started with a physics degree. I switched to computer science only later on uh, when, I was, when I got more interested with it. So I'd like to imagine that if I hadn't switched, I would be today at CERN doing particle physics experiments or, or something crazy like that. And yeah. Let's just say that's, I, I like to think that. Okay. I'm sure you would, Michal. I mean, you're, you're an extremely smart person. So if anybody has a chance to do that, I'm sure it's probably you. So what made you get out of physics and into computer science? Did you just lose interest? Was it getting like too hard? Was it not what you thought it was going to be? So I think it was mostly that the program was targeted very hard and at creating scientists working in a lab, as, as I said, somewhere Right. And I didn't really feel like that's something I'd like to do. 
for a career for like the next, I don't know, 40, 50 years. And I think programming gave me this opportunity to create things, to, to be more hands-on in, in the thing I, things I'm doing. It's still not as fun and hands-on as I know working on hardware or something like that. But, it's, but I think software uh, still, allow, still allows you to, to do a bit more concrete things. Yeah. And the nice thing about software is you're not confined by as many constraints as hardware. So physical space, the most like fundamental laws of physics, like electricity applies, but you don't have to worry about gravity, photons, or any of that other stuff generally. Yes. And depending on what part of software you're doing, like you might not also really care about memory and like speed and things like that, right? Most of the time. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good point. All right, shifting gears here. So what's the genre of the last song or the last album that you listened to? Yeah, so I actually had to think about this question for quite a while because I usually listen to a lot of different things. I listen to like pop, rock, classical music, some some harder things as well, though usually not not on my own. But I generally don't have like a very set music taste. But recently I, I discovered a, like a new Polish artist called Ralph Kaminski. And I listened to his song Kosmiczna Energia, which would translate as cosmic energies, I think. It sounds equally weird in Polish as well. And yeah, and that was for a heavy rotation for, for a while. Okay. Yeah, I listened to some of his stuff and watched his music videos. And his videos are very artsy. I don't know if you've watched any of his videos. Yeah, yeah, they, they are. They are. Now, I, I've seen I've seen his his work described as like alternative pop, or a term that's pretty common in like Poland at least, which is like sung poetry. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it, I didn't understand any of the words, but the music itself sounded pretty cool. So is there, is there a movie that you're going to watch every time you come across it on TV? So I'm not really big on re-watching things. And similarly, I'm not big on like re-reading books. I know some people have like books they read, maybe not every year, but very often, right? And come back and, and same with movies. But there's probably only like a handful. I watched multiple t- movies. I, I watched multiple times. Probably like original Star Wars trilogy on like Lord of the Rings, a- a- around those lines. So not not very original, I guess. Well, those are pretty popular movies for sure. So I'm guessing you were born after the original Star Wars trilogy came out. Hopefully, we're talking about the same original trilogy. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so how did you how did you end up on those versus like some of the newer ones? I don't. I'm actually not sure how how did I end up. It's mostly just happened through like pop culture and them playing on TV or in some other places. But yeah, I definitely did not get opportunity to watch them in the theater on the original release date. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Shots fired. (laughs) That was not my intention. So out of the original three, which one is? Which one's the one you like the best? There's a right answer, by the way, and there's definitely a wrong answer. It's definitely the right answer and wrong answer. I know, I actually didn't watch them in quite a while now. So don't remember that much, to be honest. And I know I don't want to give the wrong answer. <laughs> Too much pressure. Okay. For the listeners, episode five is the right answer. That's the one I was thinking about. But yeah, wasn't 100% sure. I wasn't trying to trap you or anything. All right. Well, finishing up our time here. So is there a project that you're like most excited about working on next or something maybe you're working on now that you're looking forward to continue working on or finishing up? I'm, I'm quite excited on, on about the things I'm working on right now at work. In particular, finishing up the project, creating a formatter for Erlang, but also the bigger project where we're trying to build static type system for Erlang. Hopefully, we'll be able to talk a bit more publicly about it soon. For now, we're kind of we're trying to figure out, even within the team, what it is that we want to do. Uh, so it's hard to talk about it publicly. Okay. Well, let's 
let's not try to talk about that too much, but I am excited for the Erlang code formatter. Are you prepared or like have you garnered feedback on how you think things should be formatted from other members of the community? Or are you gonna YOLO this one and and expect some feedback? Right now it's it's the phase where I'm gathering feedback from uh, some some key people. Uh, so I'm I'm talking with some people where I'd want want some feedback. And then later on I, I want to release it more publicly and gather a feedback from from the community before settling on some final choices. Though for the most part, I want it to work in the similar spirit and, and principles that the Elixir formatter is using, because I think it works pretty well. Okay. Yeah, I, I would agree. Although I don't fully understand the algebra that goes into all of it. I tried, but couldn't, couldn't quite make sense of it. But um, yeah, that's, that's great. I think that'll be a great project for the Erlang community and maybe hopefully draw some more people over from the Elixir side and feel a little bit more comfortable in, in the Erlang world. Yeah, and like in general, things I'm thinking now nowadays a lot is that after switching from Elixir, from working day to day with Elixir to working day to day with Erlang, I have some ideas about things I'm missing and things I'd like to be improved. Although from what I understand, the Erlang tooling improved a lot over the years. I still think there's a lot of gaps between Erlang and Elixir, especially around testing, right? If, if you compare the output of an, on the test failure you get from X units with one you get from common test, even with like the rebar patches and then improvements, it's still a big difference. Well, I, I won't say more, but yeah, I, I'd like to see it changed. Well, cool. And I think I speak for a lot of people when I say I'm really glad that that's something that you're that you're looking into or that you're considering working on. Yeah. And one thing that really surprised me about common test and the whole testing setup in, in Erlang was that in Elixir, it's very easy to make tests run in parallel, right? You basically add like async true and it just works, right? And in Erlang, or at least in common test, it's really hard and you actually the level of parallelism that X unit leverages, which is running multiple modules in parallel within the single module, this is not possible at all in common test. So yeah, for, for, for a concurrent language, it was very surprising that support for concurrency in tests is not very good. Wow. Well, it's good to see that Elixir took so much from Erlang. It, it's good to hear that people are taking things from Elixir and moving it back the other direction. Yeah, definitely. I think both like the communities can only benefit from working closer together. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Michal. It was great to get to know you a little bit better. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was really fun to, to talk to you. This has been... Another episode of Elixir Wizards. Thank you again to Eric Steen for coming on the show and to my co-host Eric Ostrich for being so patient with me. And once again, I'm Justice Epen. Elixir Wizards is a smart logic podcast here at Smart Logic. We are always looking to take on new projects, building web apps and Elixir, Rails and React infrastructure projects using Kubernetes, mobile apps using React Natives. And we'd love to hear from you if you have a project we could help you with. Don't forget to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast player. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. So add us on all of those. You can find me personally at Justice Eben and Eric at Eric Ostrich and join us again next week on Elixir Wizards for more system and application architecture. Thank you.